All right, we are in the book of Acts, uh, going into chapter number 13. Um, in our message tonight is uh, Paul as he sets out on his first missionary journey. Uh, last week we saw the desperate measures that they would go through to stop the spreading of the gospel. But we also saw the faithfulness of God to those that would uh, follow Him. We left off last week, if you remember, Peter had escaped from jail. The Spirit had, had set him free. He had come to the house. They didn't believe that he was there. He's standing and left him knocking on the door. And he's standing outside while they're wondering what's going on inside. But, but anyway, they finally let him go in. Uh, and he told them to go tell who? James. Very good. All right. Told them to go tell James. Uh, and then Peter did what? He left. Okay. Uh, if you'll remember, he was fleeing from Herod. Um, and so he left. And I told you, you know, we, we get into this thing. Some people say, well, bless God. I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to. There are some times when we have to live to fight another day. There's sometimes just by the leading of the Lord, uh, it's, we don't stay where we are. There are some times we need to back up and, and go somewhere else. And, uh, by the way, we will see that as Paul goes through his missionary journey. Sometimes he gets chased out of town. He goes to the next town and he starts spreading the gospel. In fact, Jesus said if they won't receive you to do what? Dust the dust off your feet? Move on to the next place. And so um, we need to be careful when we try to make that. I, I know we think we sound good, but it, we don't sound good when we do stuff like that. Well, I'm going to. No, if the Lord leads you, you're going. If not, then you better go wherever the Lord leads you. And so um, God had other things that needed to be done, and so Peter left. I told you last week that with that, uh, we were going to start seeing a transition. Uh, the first part of the book of Acts kind of tells us about the early church uh, in, in light of Peter's ministry. The second part of the book of Acts tells us the, the history of the early church in light of whose ministry? Paul, okay, and we're going to see that tonight as we look at what is his first missionary journey, okay? And so we see him as he goes about planting churches uh, and sharing the gospel with people. Uh, the first thing that we see here is Paul and Barnabas in Antioch of Syria, uh, there in verses 1 through 3. Um, if I could get somebody there so I don't have to keep looking behind me. Uh, if I'm talking about a point that had not come up there yet, just grab my attention because we are having a little delay on this. And so uh, just to kind of keep you up to speed on there. All right. Uh, but look at verses 1 through 3. It says, Now there were in the church that was in Antioch certain prophets and teachers, as Barnabas and Simeon, and, uh, that was called Niger and Lucius and Serene and Manan, which had been brought up with Herod the, te the tetrarch, and Saul, as they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Spirit said, Separate me, Barnabas and Saul, for the work whereunto I have called them. And when they had fasted and prayed and laid their hands on them, they sent them out. Now, I'm going to go ahead and tell you, as I told you last time we were talking about Saul, you're going to hear me say Saul and Paul, and I'm going to flip them back and forth. But we're, whether I'm saying Saul or whether I'm saying Paul, we're talking about the same individual. Okay? The first thing that we notice here is that they were chosen by the Spirit. The Holy Spirit tells the Antioch leaders to set Saul and Barnabas aside for a special work that he had for them. Uh, we see more and more churches in our day skipping this important aspect of selecting people for the ministry. Um, if God doesn't call them, they haven't been called. Not everybody's supposed to preach. Not everybody that we want to preach is supposed to preach. And I don't care who their daddy is. I don't care who their granddaddy is. I don't care who their mama is. If God didn't call them to preach, guess what? They're not supposed to be preaching. You know, I had people, uh, you know, when Zach was first getting ready to get out of high school, they said, you mean he's not going to be a preacher? You're not, you're not gear gearing him to be a preacher? No. Why? Because that's not my responsibility. My responsibility is to what? Train him up in the way that he should go, and when he's old, he won't depart from it. Isn't that right? As far as what he does, who's, whose responsibility is it with what he does? Him. him and the Lord. 
Okay? Uh, and we see that all the time. We see, you know, this person is going to be a preacher just because their daddy was a preacher. It doesn't always work that way. And we see it happen in churches. Churches like somebody and say, boy, you could be a preacher. You know, they put them up there to preach and all this stuff. It doesn't matter who we pick. It matters who God picks. Okay? Uh, and so God set these two individuals aside uh, for the ministry. And that's what we need to be careful about. Let God guide and direct who is going into the ministry. But notice they were called by the Holy Spirit, but they were commissioned by the church in verse 3. Once they had fasted and prayed, uh, the church laid hands on them, commissioning them for the ministry. Now, now, what is that? Is there any special... Now, we know what fasting is. Fasting is doing what in this particular case? Not eating. Not eating. Fasting in the more general sense of the word is what? Going without. Going without. Okay, we talked about that several weeks ago. Uh, we always think about fasting as being food. It's not always food. It's going out without something in order to use that time to spend with the Lord. So they fasted. They've gone without to spend that time to make sure that they are sending who God has called for them to send. Okay? Uh, and then they laid their hands on them. What, what kind of special power is there in the church laying their hands on them? Amen. They're in. That's what I tell people all the time. When, uh, how many how many have been part of a church service where we've anointed someone with oil? What's the power of the oil? So why do we do it? What is it? What is the what is the putting the deacons or the elders of the church anointing someone with oil, or in this case, laying hands on these people? Uh, what does what is that a picture of? What are we actually doing? Go ahead. Sue said it was a sign of faith. You were getting ready. You have the Holy Spirit to come in and heal you of whatever is wrong. And you got to ask for it, though. You can't just go, say, I want to be anointed. You got to ask God. And that's the same thing people say, I'm going to get anointed for somebody. Well, it don't work either. Not that I want it. All that's being shown there, it's a symbol of the church coming together. Now, when the elders come together and lay hands on them, the elders represent the church. Now, a church our size, we're kind of small, so a lot of times when we do it, I'll call the elders up first, and then I'll say, whoever in the church wants to come and gather around. Why? Because we're representing the church. We're small enough where we can bring the whole church up. So what's the difference between representing them and the church being there? But that's all it is. Is the church coming in agreement saying, we agree, we want the healing of this individual? In this particular case, in the book back, we agree that the Lord's calling upon these people and we're praying for these people. Okay? Uh, it's simply an act of confirming that the church acknowledges that God has called these people. Okay? That's all it is. The church didn't give them any special power. The church didn't have any special power to give them. We're just saying, yes, we recognize God's call on these individuals. Uh, it's also a sign that the church is behind them. By the way, if God called them, you better get behind them. Amen? Amen? There's some warnings in the Bible about those that will step out against the people that God has called. Now, I'll be the first to tell you, I'm not perfect. I make mistakes. But I'll also tell you, the Bible, what it says, you better be careful. When you step out against the, the, the men that God has, has called to lead the church, you step out against them. You better make sure it's in accordance with what God has said, not in accordance with just what you want to do. Because the Bible shows some pretty good dangers in there. You know what I've learned through the years? That's why I don't worry about it. Because I'm going to let God take care of it. Ain't no sense in me losing sleep over it, is it? By the way, is it any different for you? No. You know, how many like to be talked about? None of us. Can you stop it? Can you do anything about it? Not really. I mean, you can try to defend yourself, but people can believe what they want to believe, right? I can't tell you in the times of my ministry where I've told, I said, I don't know what I'm more disappointed in, the fact that they would say that or the fact that you believe it. Because people will say some mean things. 
But if you know it not to be true and you start believing it, guess what? Who answers for that? You do. Okay? So we got to be careful in the church. We, we come behind those that, that God has called and we stay behind them. And you're going to see that through Paul's ministry. That's why I'm kind of spending some time here tonight because you're going to see that. These churches that Paul's establishing, as he went from church to church, guess what? They still supported him. Okay? When he would come back through or when he needed help somewhere else, these folks, they knew he was called of God and so they helped the man of God. And it wasn't because Paul was anything special. It was because God was the, but Paul was the man that God chose to use. So, God calls, but we still need the church to make it all work. It's a group effort. A call from God, a willing vessel, because just because God calls doesn't mean we're willing to go. And then a supporting church. Those are the three things we need for any successful ministry. The calling of God, the person willing to follow that calling, and then the church to get behind that individual. How many of you have ever been in a missionary service where they're raising money for missions? And the missionary says, if you can't give anything, at least pray. Right? Uh, and a lot of people, you know, say, well, you know, they think that's a cop-out. I can't give nothing, I can pray. There, sometimes you can't give anything. But I can promise you this. If you can give something and God leads you to give something, give it. But more powerful than any dollar you can ever give is what? Prayer. Prayer. Now, by the way, if we're praying, then God will lead us sometimes to give uh, and how much to give and what to support. But when you sign a card, how many have ever signed a missionary card and said, you know, uh, the, the, the missionaries told you, if you don't do anything else, check that little box that says, I'll be praying for you. How many have checked that box? Then you better be what? Praying. That's just as much of a commitment as you would have if you said, I was sending $20 a month, $50 a month. You said you could pray for them, you need to pray for them. And by the way, they need your prayer. Church, we wonder what is wrong with the church today. I firmly believe part of the problem is the church is trying to make decisions that belong to God. We need more people praying. We need more people seeking the will of God. And if God is behind it, you don't have to worry about it failing. If we will get behind what God's behind, we don't have to worry about a fan. How many like building a winning team? Anybody know what a bandwagon fan is? You know, that, that's just your whoever wins. Who, who, did, who won the Super Bowl last year? I know Stephanie knows. She keeps up all them stats and writes it in her. I do too. I don't even know. Sue, no, Sue, Sue keeps her and Stephanie. They're talking on the phone all the time about it. You know what? I'm standing here. I don't even know. Well, Kansas, it was Kansas City. I think they were. That tells you how, how much I was in tune with football last year, doesn't it? Um, but anyway, <laughs> proves my point. Those things are temporal. But I promise you, whoever won, I think it's San Francisco played Kansas City. I don't remember. Now I gotta, now I've got my mind, I gotta go look. But I can promise you, whoever won got a whole lot more fans after the win than they had before. Why? Because people like being on a winning team. I remember, remember a couple years ago when the Panthers went to the Super Bowl or Panthers were in the playoffs here a couple years, and everybody around town was wearing all them Panthers. You ain't watched football day in your life, but you got a Panthers shirt on because the Panthers are going, because you're going to be on a winning team. Well, I got news for you. If you're going to be on a winning team, you better be on God's team, amen? Because we've read the back of the book, he's going to win. But there's only one way to be on his team, and that's not a fair weather fan. It's to surrender over to him. To his will and follow his will. And then support others that are doing it. The second stop that we see here is Paul and Barnabas, or Saul and Barnabas, Barnabas and Cyprus. Look at verses 4 through 12. Now, first of all, notice the openness to God's word in verses 4 through 7. It says, So they being sent forth by the Holy Spirit departed unto uh, Cilicia, and from thence they sailed to Cyprus, and when they had were at um, Salmas, they preached the word of God in the synagogue of the Jews, and they had also John to their ministry. And when they had gone through the Isle of Paphos, they found a certain a sorcerer, a false prophet, a Jew, whose name was Bergesus, and which was with the deputy of the country, uh, Sergius Paulus, a prudent man, 
uh, who called for Barnabas and Saul and desired to hear the word of God. So again, being sent out by the Holy Spirit, we see that their message was well received. If God sends you, you do it God's way. God knows where He's leading. Uh, and so you follow God, you're going to begin to see fruit for the labor. Uh, they preached, notice, in the synagogue first. Uh, that would become Paul's um, signature pattern. Every city he'd go to, he'd preach where first? Until what? Until when? Until they kicked him out or wouldn't listen anymore, and then he'd go preach to who? The Gentiles. Okay? All right? We also see John here. When it's talking about John, who are we talking about? John Mark, okay? We, we know him better as who? Mark, Mark okay? The gospel writer. Uh, he joined them in their journey, uh, and they even got the attention of the governor uh, who desired to hear more of the word, so he calls for Paul and Barnabas. But we also see not only the receiving of the word, but the opposition to God's word. Look at verse 8. But um, Elmas, the sorcerer, for so... Uh, is his name by interpretation, withstood them, seeking to turn away the deputy from the faith. Then Saul, which also is called Paul, and I'm so thankful that we finally get that, so now I can call him Paul, okay? Um, filled with the Holy Ghost, set his eyes on him, and said, O oh, full, oh, full of all assembly, and all mischief, thou child of the devil, thou, thou enemy of all righteousness, wilt thou not cease to pervert the right ways of the Lord. And now behold, the hand of the Lord is upon thee, and thou shalt be blind, not seeing the sun for a season. And immediately there fell on him a mist uh, and a darkness, and he went about seeking some to lead him by hand. So, uh, Elmas or Bar, Bar Jesus, guess what that word means? It actually means wise men. Not very wise. Why? Because he opposed, or he tried to turn the governor away from what he was hearing. So we have, he's interested in the faith. He's trying to do what? Distract from the faith and turn his attention away from the faith. Um, so it leads us to ask, why is he so against it? It's because it would expose him, and he'd be out of a job. A sorcerer is what? Witchcraft or magician or, you know, it's, it's one that plays with your mind through tricks. Okay? Uh, and that's how they made their money. Uh, and so, um, if, if those who come through doing the work of Jesus, doing the real deal, they would expose those who were not. And that put him out of a job. Alright? Uh, by the way, that's why many people uh, don't want to leave Congress or don't want to be revealed from Congress because it will put them out of a job. Amen? I mean, think some of them need to be put out of the job. All right, we won't get sidetracked on that, but anyway. Um, what are they doing? Using other people to make money. The, the fears of others. And that's what this sorcerer doing, using the fears of others. Okay, so he's, he wants the governor to want him to listen to what they have to say. So Paul turns his focus to him. Okay, you wanted our focus, now you got it. How many think he was probably wishing he didn't do that? All right, he calls him out. He says... Oh, full of guile. In other words, he's calling him a false prophet. He calls him right there in front of everybody. You're a false prophet. Everything that you do is a fake. He, he says mischief. In other words, this, this magician. And, uh, again, using uh, the sleight of hand or the sight or, 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 or using uh, you know, what people want to see. Um, how, many, how, you know, how many know that's how magic works, by the way? We get to see what we want to see. And so we miss the things sometimes that are happening in the middle. And then he goes a little step further. He says, son of the devil. Um, it's a suited title for those who would not receive the truth themselves, but they tried to keep others from receiving. Now, if you don't want to receive Christ, fine. I think it's an ignorant choice, but I respect that choice. The problem I had is you want to go to hell, and you want to do what? Take everybody else with you. Now that's when I got a problem. All right? Let other people make a decision for themselves. Let them see the facts. Let them get educated and let them make the decision for themselves. 
Paul goes a step further. He says, enemy of all righteousness. In other words, he, he stood against everything that was right. Paul basically says, how long are you going to pervert the right way of the Lord? And then after calling him out and exposing him in front of everybody, what did Paul do to him? Struck him blind. All right. Now notice though, this was only temporary. Okay, he didn't say it struck him blind for the rest of his life. How do we know that? For a season. For a season. Okay, that's what that word means. For a season, it means a temporary time. Now, well, we don't know how long the time was, but for a season means there was a set time that he would be blind. Interesting. One of the things that I did when I was raising my children, and, and I'm not a perfect parent, don't claim to be a perfect parent, but one thing I do when I counsel people do, I said, always make the punishment fit the crime. What happens a lot of times is, is you know, our, our kids will do something uh, and we'll go way overboard on the punishment. Uh, and so, like, for example, if my kids came home uh, and they were having problems talking in class, ignoring the teacher, being disruptive of all those things, they violated communication, correct? Isn't that what they were doing? They were misusing communication. So what do you reckon I took away from them when they got home? Their phone. Punishment did what? Fit the crime. Okay? Uh, and and that's, that's kind of smart parenting. Because if you go off the deep end right off the bat, what more do you have to take away from them? How many of our children mess up more than once? So there needs to be different levels of what? Punishments. How many here have ever been punished by God? So how many know there are different levels of punishment? Any of you ever been struck blind? Okay, so there's different levels of punishment. Be thankful you haven't gotten to that level yet. <laughs> Don't get to that level, okay? Uh, and so it's interesting here, this false prophet was doing what to people? <laughs> Leading them astray or blinding them to the truth. So what was his punishment? And did anybody catch what he spent his time doing? Look down at verse 11. And he went about doing what? Seeking some to lead him by the hand. Anybody catch that when you read that? I look for things like that. The Lord said, okay. You want to know what it's like to be blind and be led around blind? You're going to experience it right now. So he caused him to be blind and he was dependent upon other people to lead him around. And that's what he did to other people. If you'll read the scriptures, it's amazing how often God does those kind of things. When he punishes the people, the punishment fits the crime. It fits the violation of what they've done. And so, uh, we can't say that God is not fair because God is always fair. Then we see obedience to God's word in verse 12. It says, Then the deputy which uh, he saw what was done, when he saw what was done, believed, being astonished at the doctrine of the Lord. So Bar Jesus' efforts actually had the exact opposite effect of what he was intending them to do. He was trying to distract them away from God or to get them not focused on God, but this actually did what? Put the focus where? <laughs> Right there on the work of God. Alright, so we see the whole ordeal actually drew the governor to the Lord. Instead of pushing him away, it drew him to it. Yeah, how many people know that curiosity will bring people in? I tell people that all the time about the church. If, if you think something's going on, how many of you want to know what's going on? You hear, you hear the Lord about doing something or something? You're curious, you want to find out for yourself. There's a reason that the, the, the phrase out there says curiosity killed the cat. When we get curious, we're going to go find it. Folks, I'm going to tell you, when God's people get excited about serving God and God begins the work, word's going to get out, people are going to get curious, and they're going to come and want to see for themselves. That's exactly what happened here. The, the one thing that was supposed to push the governor away actually drew him in because now he's curious. He got the attention. Look at verse 13. We see Paul and Barnabas at Perga. 
It says, Now when Paul and his company loosed from Epaphos, they came to Perga and Pamphylia, and John departed from them, returning to Jerusalem. Now, just a simple facts mentioned in this verse. We don't really are, are, aren't really told. Uh, if you look at verse 14, which because of time we're not going to get there tonight, but look at verse 14, it says, But when they departed Perga. So in other words, that's all we know about what happened in Perga. There's something that happens here. What happens there? I think that's the only reason right now that this gets mentioned in this journey. What happens there at that place? We're all not listening. Look again at verse 13. John departed. There you go. Mark left. And he goes what? Go back to Jerusalem. All right. Now, I want you to store that little bit of information. How many already know why I'm telling you to store that little bit of information? All right, Sam does. I want you to, to store that. We don't know what happened. But we know John was chosen. Mark was chosen to join this missionary team. And at this place, he does what? He leaves them. And he goes back to Jerusalem. Now, I'll go ahead and do a spoiler alert. Who knows what's going to happen down the road? Anybody other than Sam, Stephanie? Steph says she thinks she knows. Um, somebody's going to want John or Mark to join back in on one of Paul's journeys. And what's going to happen? Paul doesn't want him. Why? Because of whatever happened here. He couldn't count on it. Now, another spoiler alert down the road when all's coming to an end on Paul, Paul calls for an individual and he wants him there. What individual is that that he wants there during his last days? Mark. Okay. So whatever it was, we, we don't really know a lot of detail about it, but that's why I want to point out here, and I think that's why this is mentioned here, because we're not told anything else about what happens there other than that one event that, that he leaves and goes back to Jerusalem. Whatever it was caused some friction between Paul and Mark. Uh, so much so that down the road when, when Paul had to choose who he was heading out with on another missionary journey, he didn't want to take Mark with him. Okay? Uh, and by the way, uh, if, if uh, our, Sam, me and Sam and Stephanie and Sue, uh, we're, we're all going out on, on a mission work here. And we get out there and we're in the middle of the work and Stephanie says, you know what, I'm, I'm, I'm heading back home. What do you think we're going we're to think about Stephanie? They ain't going to like that too much, are we? Why? Because we count on her. She was supposed to be there, supposed to be part of work. We count on her and, and now she's gone. So next time when it comes up and she says, hey, I'm going with y'all, what do you think we're going to think? <laughs> nah, it's all right, you stay. <laughs> Am I wrong? So again, we don't know the details. We can only speculate about the details. But I do want to point that out, and we'll see it. I, I want you to, I, I'm telling you now because I want you to see it as we get further into the book. We'll see it as, 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 as everything comes to an end there later on in Paul's writings when everything's coming to an end and Paul knows that it's coming to an end, one of the people that he calls for is Mark. So whatever it was here, by the time all said and done, was, was smoothed out. Okay? Why do I say that? We're family. How many got family? Joe's got about 29 brothers and sisters. And... How many got a big family? How many got big families? All right. How many fight with your families? How many have brothers and sisters? Boy, can y'all imagine them knock down drag outs between Pax and Deborah when they was growing up? <laughs> boy, I, boy, I bet that was some good ones, don't you think? Who won? You can tell us she ain't here. Who won? Probably me. All right, here we go. Well, I tell mom. Pax, if you're watching online, she says she got you. She took you. So anyway. Um, but anyway, and I've told y'all, my, me and my, I'm, I'm the middle child. I've got a brother that's 18 months older, sister that's about 18 months younger now. I'm the middle. Uh, and so me and my brother, we was always fighting. But you didn't pick on my brother. 
My brother was he my brother's a peaceful guy. He doesn't like conflict, doesn't like fighting. I was not. I was the exact opposite. You tell me my shoe was tied wrong and I just beat you up just because of that. That's just how I was. All right. I was not always a preacher. I'm not proud of that. I was not always that's just how I was. I was I was looking to get into something. So I can talk about them and, and, and they can talk about me and we can fight all we wanted at home. But when we got out of the house, guess what? Uh-uh. That's my family. Church, we will have disagreements. We will have things that we don't always see eye to eye on in, in the body of Christ. But guess what? We're family. And when it all comes down to it, we've got to be there for one another. That's why I share with you about Mark and Paul. When it all came down to it, he said, it is good. He's good for me. Okay? Uh, and so whatever problem you have with another brother or sister, let it go. How many people does it take to forgive? They don't have to accept it. But to keep it, let it eat at you, it's like letting them live rent-free in your mind. Let it go. Give it over to the Lord and move on. If for no other reason, because they're brothers and sisters in the, in, in the Lord. And we got a job to do. We've got a work to do. We are on a missionary journey if we're doing what we're supposed to be doing. That doesn't mean we're overseas somewhere. It doesn't mean we're, you know, someplace. You know, we're missionaries right where we are. We're on that journey. And we are good for one another. And when you come together, guess what? We've committed to be there for one another. So we're counting on you. And we need you. I am so glad to begin to see in our church the rebounding a little bit from this virus. You know, how long will it take before we fully rebound? I don't know. Will we ever fully rebound? I don't know. But it's good to start seeing us rebound. How many get an amen on that? Amen. amen. Um, and so um, we just need to keep on pushing forward because there is still work to be done. All right, that's our time tonight. Uh, in uh, next week, we're going to pick up here at verse 14, uh, and we're going to see Paul and Barnabas at another Antioch. There's more than one Antioch there, so uh, we're going to hit the other one next week, okay? Uh, and so we've, we've begun the journeys. How many, just a, a quick quiz for you, how many missionary journeys is Paul going to go on? Three. Yeah, there will be three all together um, by the time all is said and done in that, okay? Uh, and by the way, some will revisit the same places that he went in other missionary journeys. But what we're seeing here is the establishment of the church. This is the early church. This is, this is our history. Um, by the way, how many Jews we have here? None? How many Gentiles we have here? All right. If you weren't a Jew, guess what? You're a Gentile. This is our history, okay? This is the early church. Uh, and so we all want to learn it. We all want to be able to get into the Word and find out where it all started from. Uh, and you hear people say sometimes, boy, I wish we could return to the good old days. Now, I don't necessarily mean all of the good old days, but certainly that around the Word of God. We need to return to those good old days. Amen? Let's pray. Father, we love you. We thank you again for the time that you've given us in your Word. And Father, as we begin this study, Lord, of Paul and setting out on this uh, first of three missionary journeys, Father, Lord, we... See the importance of answering your call, Lord, receiving uh, the guidance and direction from the Holy Spirit, and Lord, then the, uh, Lord, the anointing, if you will, from the church, Lord, knowing that the church is behind us. And Father, we're all supposed to be missionaries in this day. Wherever we go, we're supposed to be spreading the gospel, the good news. So Lord, help us to support one another, to be there for one another, to pray for one another, Lord, as we continue to go forth with your word. And Father, we just trust you that you'll give us fruit for the labor. Father, as we, Lord, even go our separate ways now, Father, open up doors of opportunity, and Lord, help us to walk through them, and Lord, uh, that we might be a blessing to those around us, but more important than anything else, we might be faithful to you. We'll give you the praise for it all in Christ's name.